Greetings everyone, Tim Anderson here, aka Renfell, and welcome to this brand new series, kind of something new that I'm, I'm trying out. And this, this kind of all got sparked because of Baldur's Gate 3 that's been announced by Larian Studios last year. Um, they just did a really cool live stream recently where they announced that the most updated version of the Early Access is going to be starting uh, September 30th, 2020. Uh, it's currently August 23rd, 2020, 2020, excuse me. And I said, you know what? I'm going to dive in and do some videos on Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, probably Icewind Dale 1 and 2 as well. But specifically for now, I wanted to do Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. Um, I'm using the Enhanced Editions, which I have played before when they first came out. Uh, but really what I want to do is take a look back at these first two games and analyze them for people who might not have ever played them before and say, hey, you know, are these games worth playing? Is it worth going back and playing Baldur's Gate 1 and Baldur's Gate 2 given how old these games are? Is it worth playing them considering they may or may not have that much to do with Baldur's Gate 3? And I think the answer to that question, at least for me, is absolutely. But I'm also a fan of these games because these games uh, came out when I was, you know, in my late teens and kind of during my formative, you know, video game playing years when I was really getting into the genre um, on the PC anyway. And Baldur's Gate 1 in particular stands out to me as one of those first kind of kind of the pillar of of the isometric games that kind of started it all for me. And I think it kind of started it off for the genre as a whole so uh, you can look at all these other games that have come since then like uh, the first dragon age origins you know the pillars of eternity one and two uh, the pathfinder kingmaker game um but you know looking at Baldur's gate one in particular that's the game i'm going to be diving into for this particular video and analyzing and saying hey you know is is this something that you might want to play you know in the weeks and months leading up to the release of Baldur's Gate 3 because even though the early access is starting on September 3rd, uh, 30th excuse me uh, they've said that they plan on being in early access for quite some time probably a year i would estimate so you've got plenty of time to play Baldur's Gate 1, Baldur's Gate 2, and if you have time, probably Icewind Dale 1 and 2, which are great games. I still think Icewind Dale 1 in particular has one of the best soundtracks of any game I've ever played. But I digress. For now, let's dive into Baldur's Gate 1 and kind of take a look at how this game has aged, if, if it has at all. Um, I think uh, I've played this game multiple times over the years. Uh, both the original version and then the enhanced version which came out in 2012 and I will say that the enhanced version is very well done. Beamdog has made a name for themselves as the company in terms of remaking these old Dungeons and Dragons classic games and they kind of came into it at the beginning of that whole remake era and now we're you know this was 2012 i believe when it came out in 2020 i mean everything's being remade you've got world of warcraft classic you've got all the emulator servers for everquest and etc um but let's dive in here um if you're not familiar with the second edition uh, advanced dungeons and dragon rules uh it might be a little bit of a switch because for those of you who are familiar with uh, 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, which by the way, um, Baldur's Gate 3 is going to be using, uh, the rule set was quite a bit different back in the day. The lore has also changed quite a bit for um, Faerun, uh, but for the most part, unless you're a complete you know, uh, rule fanatic, the rules aren't going to affect your gameplay that much, but it does help to understand how the rules work because when you go about character creation, there are going to be a lot of options when you're going through the character creation process. And unless you're familiar with AD&D, uh, you're going to be looking at these going like, what the hell is Thacko? <laughs> uh, Thacko stands for to hit armor class zero. And back in the day, everything revolved around hitting armor class zero so uh you know having a positive number meant your armor class was really crappy and having a negative number meant your armor class was really good uh, so that's just modifiers basically if you have a negative armor class of say negative four then the mob needs to roll you know with a, a 
a four modifier against you so it's harder for them to roll so they it's just it's a different way of doing things so if you're not familiar with the thaco system um it really doesn't matter unless you have the dice rolls turned on in the options <clears throat> excuse me which you can do but that's really only there for the rule uh fanatics so for the most part if you're just wanting to dive in and play the game <clears throat> excuse me it's not going to be that big of a deal so you know you go through the character creation process you know you'll look at gender race class alignment so on and so forth um, and then you get into uh, choosing your character portrait and the old images are the first ones that show up these are the you can really kind of tell what they are because they do have a higher kind of resolution image and but then you get to the end and you'll notice that we switch over to this new style, which is kind of like the Icewind Dale style of images. It's a little more grittier, a little darker. These are the new images that Beamdog has put into place. There's a lot more options for people who want to customize their character portrait. And the portrait doesn't really matter except for you know where it shows up as the character portrait in the group window. Other than that, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, beyond the character portrait, this is when you get into um, choosing your race. And this is where, if you're familiar with the 5th edition, these bonuses and descriptions might be a little different. Uh, but for the most part, it's kind of the same. You've got human elves, half elves, dwarves, halflings, gnomes, half orcs. Um, and they all have pros and cons, uh, racial bonuses, so on and so forth. And from there, you can get into uh, your class. And they've got lots of classes, multi-classes, etc., um, I typically have played, every time I've played these games for the first time, I always go with a thief character, um, but you can choose whatever you want, um, and then you've got subclasses that you can go from, uh, choose from, and those have specific bonuses, pros and cons as well, uh, depending on what you want to be doing, and then you get into the abilities, uh, which you can then choose your various, you know, uh, abilities, and I think one of the coolest parts about Baldur's Gate 1 is the fact that you have... A total number of points and you can sit here and re-roll until you get like a maximum number that you're looking for a total maximum number of points and then you can adjust the stats as you see fit and the strength one in particular is, is an area that might confuse people if you roll a fighter class character because you can go beyond 18 uh, and the old rule set 18 strength is 18 strength but you could have if you're a fighter class, uh, you could have an 18 slash something. 1800 was the strongest, but it could be 1805, 1827, 1865 or something. Basically, you can sit here and re-roll your character as much as you want if you want to to kind of create a min-max character, which, of course, I do. Um, and you can go from there and tweak your stats as you want, and then you get into the proficiency slots for your weapon proficiencies. Um, in, in this case, because I had a ranger, I went with a racial enemy. Um, choose your character character color scheme which really doesn't matter that much it's just kind of changing the way your avatar looks when they're without armor and then you can choose your voices which there are the default voices um, and then there's also voices that beamdog has added which are it's kind of fun so you have some extra options and then of course you pick your name and then you can get right into the game and once you dive in I think especially thinking back to when I first played this game one of the coolest aspects um, uh, oh, and before I get too far ahead of myself, obviously you can choose the, the difficulty setting of the game, um, depending on how hardcore you want to be. Um, and then we dive in. And, and this is one of the things, before I got ahead of myself, that I really loved about this game was the, the chapter narration. So every time you enter into a new chapter or a new major section, you're going to get one of these um, narration sequences sequences excuse me which um considering that back in the day when these games came out uh voiceovers were becoming more common but they weren't you know that common i'm um, having these sections where you have a narrator who's kind of telling you what's going on and the story uh, and and kind of giving you a sense of this is where the adventure is and this is what you're about to do i think that's just one of those things that really struck me and it's still to this day i just there's i love it i just i really love it <laughs> it's a really cool aspect um of the Baldur's gate games was these narrated sections in between 
um, the chapters and to you know give you a sense of what's going on. It's not just between the chapters; they they show up in other places as well. Um, and then also, as you go throughout the game, you'll notice that there are moments when there are scripted encounters that take place, which uh, basically uh, your character will go into this. You know, you'll, the, the UI will drop away, and it will enter into this. Um, scripted sequence where something takes place and you're just meant to, to sit and watch and kind of absorb that story component as it's going on and then you get into it and you can react to what just happened. Um, going into the gameplay of this game, again you can always uh, adjust the difficulty. I like to play on the core rule settings. I don't really need to play it more hardcore than that because core rules is quite uh, difficult as it is. Uh, the one thing that I love about Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 as well as Icewind Dale 1 and 2 and it's one of the components that I really was disappointed uh, with when they did the Neverwinter Nights games. And I'm also, I have to admit, you know, it was, just, it was somewhat of a disappointment to know that they're doing the same thing in Baldur's Gate 3. Um, but anyway, uh, I love the six person party system and that's something that you get in Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 as well as Icewind Dale 1 and 2 was you got six people in your party and so you you really have a lot more flexibility in terms of you know approaching combat and of course because there are all these side characters that you're going to meet throughout your journeys good and bad so on and so forth and because this is an early you know Black Isle game kind of the precursor to Bioware and Obsidian and everything else. Uh, you know, you can have romances with your characters. You can. Uh, they have their own alignments, and how you interact with the world around you can cause characters to be happy with you or be unhappy with you. Um, if you don't, you know, if, if a person joins your party and is there to, you know, they are asking your help to complete a quest and you don't help them quickly enough, they'll leave your party. They'll start complaining before they do, kind of giving you a heads up that, hey, this, you know, you need to be helping us out or we're going to head out. Um, and depending on how you choose to react to the world around you, there will be times when if you're doing something good and you have somebody in your party who's not a good alignment and you get a positive reputation for completing a quest, that person will complain. And if you do too much good stuff, that bad person will leave and the reverse is also true if you have a, a character in your party who is a negative character um, a, a, a evil aligned character they will leave your party if you start doing uh, excuse me if you have a good person in your party if you start doing too many evil things the, the good person will leave so alignment is important uh, the choices that you make are important i'd say the one thing that is really i think this is one of those games where you go back far enough there weren't a lot of tips and things to hold your hand so as an example um, you don't get any waypoints or anything like that you do get uh, in your quest journal and when you're talking to NPCs you'll get general directions in terms of where things might be you know, ter in terms of where you might need to be going next to uh, seek the next adventure or what you need to be doing for the quest but things are quite often hidden in the world so I mean in the very beginning one of the first quests you do in Candlekeep is uh, there's uh, a lady in town who asks you to find a book that she's misplaced. And if you read the quest, it gives you a hint about where she lost her last book. And if you follow the hint, it basically she lost the book in the exact same place as she lost her last book. And those are the types of things that you have to pay attention to because you're not going to get glowing waypoints or anything like that telling you where to go. So it really is this world where you can immerse yourself and it's quite large. Uh, I don't remember exactly how many zones there are, but I know that uh, Beamdog has added additional zones and additional content on top of the base game and the expansions that came along with it. Um, but uh, this is one of those things where the more you explore, um, the funner it is. And that's where you get the fog of war effect that's going on. And as you explore the world, you'll uncover the fog of war. You'll uncover quest items as well as NPCs. You'll uncover secrets and encounters that lead to other quests. It's a game that is incredibly involving. And this is one of those places where I say that despite the fact that this came out, game came out you know, in the 90s, we're still 
you know, I think it's still worth playing today for the sheer amount of content that you're going to get out of it. And as big as Baldur's Gate 1 is, Baldur's Gate 2 is even bigger. I'll, I'll never forget when that game first came out and I was sitting there looking at these four CDs that it came on. It was just like my mind was blown that it came on four CDs, which in by day, today's standards, it's, you know, not that big of a game in terms of the size of you know gigabytes but in terms of the amount of content and the hours played i still think Baldur's gate 2 is up there with it's still in my top three games of all time after all these years it still is up there i would put it up there with witcher 3 um and probably red dead redemption 2 those games they all give you just so much content um Maybe God of War is in there as well. The most recent God of War from last year, the year before, you know, there's just, but it's one of these games that, you know, there's just tons of content and there's a lot of replayability because even though there is a main storyline, the way that your characters interact with the world changes depending on your alignment and what type of character you have. It's even more so because you get some, a lot of side quests of Baldur's Gate 2, which we'll cover later on in the other series that we're going to be talking about with uh, Baldur's Gate 2. But for the meantime, for Baldur's Gate 1, I think this is a game that if you really enjoy the top-down isometric view, if you enjoy Dungeons & Dragons lore, if you, if you enjoy the Forgotten Realms universe, and you love a game that has a ton of content, uh, you are going to have to read. It's, it's a lot of a lot of lore and a lot of reading. Um, it's not fully voiced. It is uh, there are voiced sections. Uh, you do have to read a lot, but I mean it's like a good book. I mean if you really just if you enjoy that type of content and you enjoy that type of connection with a game and you really want to just put yourself into it and be the character and immerse yourself in the world and the lore, I think personally that Baldur's Gate has still some of the best content available that you're going to get even in 2020. It is dated in terms of the graphics, even the enhanced version, you know, especially if you zoom in close enough, you're going to see that the game does not hold up by today's standards of graphics, especially if you compare it to like Divinity Sin, uh, uh, Divinity Original Sin 2 or Pillars of Eternity or, or modern isometric games. Um, but it's still well worth it. And I think it's well worth your time. And I would hope that you invest the time to play it if you've never done so before and sink your teeth into the world of Baldur's Gate and as you prep and wait for Baldur's Gate 3 which is coming coming out let's say soon we'll just leave it at that soon so I hope you all enjoyed this video this is a new type of series for me I've never done these types of you know is the game worth it should I play it type of video before but you know during the pandemic I've got nothing else to do with some of my spare time so I figured I'd jump in and play these games and put together some videos about it uh, as of the time of this recording I'm actually streaming uh, Baldur's Gate 1 over on Twitch you also find the videos here on YouTube as I get them uploaded and everything else so don't forget to check all the links in the video description below if you like the types of videos that I'm making here on YouTube please subscribe and I will see you in the next episode sometime in the near future